the thing, I mean, this was the development of, you know, Quantel started out, um, it, it was a military company, uh, and they had developed uh, for missile guidance um, a variety of digital systems. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, it's a very limited um, clientele because you, you've basically got the military might be divided into army, air force and navy in any given country, but that's a maximum of three departments and usually just, you know, the, the, the Ministry of Defence and most, and then the number of countries in the world that had armies that would use those modern things. So it was very limited. So they were looking around, as a number of computer companies were, um, for additional markets where they could sell this technology. Uh, and uh, the, the, there were basically two, which were medical and entertainment. So mili military stuff was all expanded out. And, and so the, like Silicon Graphics and all those companies, that's what they did. Um, because at the end, you know, the end of the war, the, suddenly these companies that had been developing these things, um, they, the, the, the requirements for military became less. I mean, the, the Cold War it still was there, but it was much less than during the war. And so you have to find things, and you know, you have other examples like Nikon that made the sights for guns and stuff, you know, became a camera manufacturer. So. Um, that was Quantel, and it, the, the company was called Micro Consultants, um, and then they set up a subsidiary to do entertainment, and they and they call it Quantel for quantized for quantization is the sampling that you make something digital. Quant quantized Quantel for television. So Quantel was this quantized effects um, that Micro Consultants did for military for television. Uh, and um, so the first thing they did was what was called a time-based career because all these things that I believe you've discussed in other programs about uh, umatics and, uh, and electronic news gathering and they're starting to edit with umatic and then going from tape to tape machines. Um, you had all that, but the trouble was that when they went on to umatics, the signal was unstable, electronically speaking, not to do with the picture, but to do with the actual... Um, where a new line would start and where a new page or a new image would start. So these pulses became noisy and they invent and, and using digital techniques, you were able to make a thing called a time-based corrector that stripped off, left the picture bit and stripped off all the technical stuff and put on clean technical stuff. And that was a time-based corrector. And mm -hmm. so Quantel did one of the first digital ones. That was their first product was a digital one, which I think was Quantel 3000. And as an aside, because they captured the whole frame and momentarily had it in a store, then there were other things you could do with it. And they just, it didn't cost them anything to do it. They added a couple of things. To tr there were lots of people doing this. There were, you know, five or six companies making time-based correctors. And so you want to distinguish yourself. And so they realized, because they were mathematicians, that you could read out in reverse order and that would then get the picture back to front and you could reverse the time frame and you could make it upside down so you could go in other words do all the lines st start in the bottom go like that and you got it upside down or you could do all the lines instead of going like that you could go like that and it would be back to front so they put in you could flip it or you could flop it uh, and then the other thing they made was you could move it around so that if you were you know putting a picture inside a caption, you could do that. And then the other thing that they'd noticed, just as viewers, because they knew nothing about television, but as viewers, they'd always noticed the newsreaders and in magazine programs that they had in those days, like Tonight or whatever, um, they had the, the presenter and over their shoulder was, this, was a, usually about a quarter of screen, was a quarter screen box. Um, so if they're talking about, um, you know, uh, uh, the, I um, don't want to talk about anything that will date this. So if, if they're talking about, um, you know, shops, they're talking about something in fashion, they'll have a shot of uh, a shop in the picture. So they'll have a shot of Harrods up in the, in the screen. Now, the way that this was done was really cack-handed and consisted of an area of black drapes in the corner of the studio. And inside it was the best monitor they had and a camera with a zoom lens. 
and then in his viewfinder he had the picture of the newsreader and then there was the blue box and so he would zoom the camera back and miss frame it so that the monitor was inside the blue box and then in the vision mixer they would cut his picture into the blue screen and so the newsreader would have you shot a Harrods and the correct size all shrunk and everything. So Quantel realised that this was usually about a quarter frame and the thing was the same way as reading the file out backwards or upside down they could also just read every other pixel and every other line and if you do every other pixel and every other line you get a quarter screen image. So they added that facility on the 3000 and had a joystick where you could move it about. Well, what happened was they started to sell this box and mysteriously, you know, it was meant for offline edit suites and, uh, you know, and newsrooms. But they suddenly, you know, camera departments all over the place were buying it and people were all buying one of these because they wanted a freeze frame facility for drawing mats and they wanted uh, the quarter screen facility for doing effectsy things. So I show, you know, something like Doctor Who. Um, and, um, but every single company that bought this said, uh, oh, but we want to be able to make that any size. We don't just want to call, why is it locked to quarter screen? And Quantel, and there were so many people, they didn't tend to take notice of what people said, but there were so many people that um, asked for this, that they realized this was a must. So they thought, well, this is for effects people though. This is not mm -hmm. for that. It's not for graphics, it's not for news. It's not for offline edit suites. This is, um, you know, for mainline production in, in drama or, or dance programs. So um, anyway, that led to the Quantel 5000 that was the effects box and allowed you to zoom the image in and out you could program it so that it started in one place and you press the button and it went to another place. And, and it, it allowed the frame to go backward, it allowed to go upside down. And you could program these so that it looked like it flipped. So things would look like they were doing that or look like they yeah. were doing that. Of course, they were only doing this. They weren't doing this, they were doing this. But in fact, if you did it quickly, <coughs> it looked like it was spinning. So they, they put that functions on that box. Um, and this sold tremendously well and opened up a whole new field in television of of what we now call visual effects. They initially call it electronic effects and then they call it video effects and then it became digital and so that was that. So, um, what year was that? So, I don't know, about 1980? What, no, what year was that? About 1980, I right. would think. Okay. I would imagine. That was before my, that was before my um, time. And then this led Quantel's management to say well what else could this this huge market here and nobody else is doing it what else can we do and then they of course being computer people knew about in the universities the all the experimentation with electronic painting which was the thing that you know in the r d in universities they were starting to look at as the kind of nascent computer graphics and they decided they wanted to be the first out now there weren't there was there was AVA, which was Ampex Video, AVO, Ampex Vid Video Opticals. Um, that was at the same time as the paint box, but the paint box won. They were in competition and the paint box came out better. I mean, it was very clunky, the Ampex one, but you know, it was. And they had Ampex Digital Optics, was their zooming machine. So th that was the equivalent of, and slightly behind the 5000, but it. When you, did, when you did this on their one, it did this. So theirs had perspective. So when things turned, they, they went like this. So it looked like something swiveled. So in other words, when, it, when this edge got mm -hmm. bigger as it went round yes. and this edge got yeah, yeah. smaller yeah. as it went. So the Ampex Digital Optics Edo uh, was the one after the Quantel and that replaced it and actually became more popular and they sold more than Quantel did. But Quantel then brought the, the paint box out and Ampex brought the Ava out and the paint box won for that one. And that was the reason that they came to this idea of producing this electronic art machine because they'd conquered the kind of in-studio, you know, live television graphics type scenario. And what they were looking at was, can we do the graphics as well as we've done like television, we've done sizing of pictures. Can we do the actual generation of the artwork as well? And that's what the paint box was. And so that was the first one. And then they were being asked, well, they realized it was just 
th this one does a, has, a, has a slight memory in it, but the original one, which is what I worked on, was only did one frame at a time. And then, of course, they realised well, you can't do any proper animation or anything with that. You need to be able to animate and you need to have a memory so that you can Creation. record all the frames yeah. one after yeah. the other and create an animation. Um, so that was the next thing and that came like the, this this later version of the paint box, V series paint box, allow you to do some of that. But then they realized that actually people wanted you, you could use the same technology to do it with pictures completely and put together um, the editing that the time based correctors had done, the picture moving that the 5000 FX box did, the painting that this did, you could put them all together in a digital okay. environment without any generations and therefore you could go on adding layers forever and that was Harry and that was a Harry which was for doing like whole commercials, it had 90 seconds of storage so you could do a 30 second commercial in it um, and but it was all inside it and then people said well yeah but you know, can we have a version for just doing edit? We need more memory. We need five minutes or ten minutes of memory so we can do an entire commercial. And that was Henry. And then I don't know what happened after that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a natural progression. Of you, you do one thing and then you realise, my God, it opens up the world to something new. You and know? also the designers and operators yeah. could then say to the people, it's great, you need to do this yes. though. So it was very led by the designer and, and the operator. And colour graded, we want colour grading, yeah. we want to be able to edit, we want to be able this to do This is too long, screen. I want to be able to ramp up this mm. in this mode, not have to come mm. out or not have to yeah. reload keyframes, I want, I want it to flow better. Mm. I mean, but it flows you know, brilliantly yeah. anyway, it's a concept on its own, this machine was just yes. out there. So they could only improve on things. This was they the base only... that they built a whole mm. city. Yeah. Well, it's a family. And uh, family. Yes. <laughs> and and the the other thing was that the Harry, of course, allowed them to do blue screen, mm -hmm. which this was this kind of allowed you to do roto slowly by hand. But the Harry allowed you to do blue screens where you shot a character against blue or laterally green, and then uh, put them into a background, and that allowed you to do that digitally. Yeah. So. That's something to, I've just gone through and done a few frames, I think. There we go, just jumping around. Go slowly to do it, but mm. but that was... Go on. Just in the time I said that. Well, I was a half kind of... Oh, yeah, it took me that long yeah. to... But I can't still find play wherever it's gone. Is it about it? Well, yeah. No. Oh, yeah. I think it takes time to do it, but that's very punky sort of poppy art sort of feel was just you know what MTV, well, was, MTV, was, MTV was, was about for, it was it? Yeah. yeah yeah as but what you know did MTV come to exist like it did because of this or did this come to exist like it did because of MTV you uh, know, it's just it a, just, it was just a moment two things came together yeah it was you know? well it was like a welcome moment on both sides yeah. wasn't it so um yeah it was, it was fantastic it was a good time and this was yeah, just the machine to do it really. So, what else? What else did you do then? So, what, your your background and your history. You, um, where did you? Well, when did you? Did, when did you see this? Well, what happened was, um, I came from a completely different angle from you. I mean, I was a cameraman in the BBC, and I was interested in effects. Uh, and so, you know, to cut a long story short, there were three of us that set up. Uh, electronic or video effects mm -hmm. um, and so and, and that was this was like we were doing Doctor Who and Blake 7 and uh, Wednesday play play for the day type you know big dramas uh, and I therefore you know we used blue screen a lot mm -hmm. um, and I was very familiar with that and a, a commercials company moving picture company um, which was a, a commercials production company, but it inv instead of buying yachts in the Mediterranean, had invested all their money in buying video gear because right. the managing director of Moving Pictures, a guy called Mike Luckwell, he thought, this is amazing. The I want to do electronic yeah. photography, you know, this is going to take everything over. This is, I mean, you know, he saw that right back then, but nobody else did. And, and he thought, this, this is fantastic because you can see the picture immediately. And that's where music, and you don't have to process that's where music. It video started as well do you know what I mean you, were you, were, you were coming they were coming to you were they not coming to you with clients wanting music no, videos no we never did 
they never paid Did anything. They? So no, right. Never... No, no, this was commercials. <laughs> was he, commercials. He, was, he was a commercials production company. Right, right. And he th and when he saw video, he thought this is the thing. You don't have to have the labs, you don't have to have any of that, you can do it all yourself. Yeah. And as a production company, they invested their money, they yeah. bought a camera, they the bought a little van for because the, it needed a generator. They bought a Bosch Frenze handheld camera, one of the first ones you can get. They bought two inch video machines that were, you know, cost yeah. hundreds of thousands of pounds. I set up an edit suite and everything. And, and he was very much into that. And so they'd been going for a while and, you know, they did some production, but mostly still was on film. Um, and they, there was a thing called the Ultimat that was the oh, that Rolls Royce of blue screen <laughs> devices. And this was invented in California. And it was where you could do blue screen, but when you had wide shots, the shadows Were. would carry through and be reproduced. Yeah. So you have a, a shot of a person that, you, you know, you had the actor in front of a blue screen and then you're putting them into a park scene. It and it never looked that. real because they never had a shadow, but this would reproduce. reproduce. If you let it so that there was a decent shadow right. and not hundreds of shadows, um, then uh, a single shadow and it was, you know, it, the, the, the tonal range was good, Generous then it could it. take it through onto the background. Obviously, then you had to get your perspective and everything absolutely perfect because if the shadow went at the wrong angle, then it would all, then it or if the shadow went the opposite direction of the <laughs> shadow on the tree behind you. So <laughs> the, the, suddenly there was an awful yeah. lot more of planning. But anyway, and Mike Luckwell, who was getting excited by, you know, the success of the company using electronic editing mm -hmm. and electronic photography, um, thought this is a, the latest thing, you know, I'm going to get it. And he got this, but then none of the film lighting cameramen that they used on their commercials could, could light for the Ultimat. They couldn't, you okay. know, they couldn't light the blue screen. And that's where you... Um, and so he headhunted around and found me in the BBC. Um, and... Um, and I went freelance, but event, you know, after a very short time, he talked me into joining them. And I went there because I could light for the Ultimat. Mm -hmm. And so I was their kind of electronic photographer, stroke effects man. Okay. Um, and they come, you know, and then they got the first five thousand. The first, they got the very first Quantel that was bought by anybody. Mm -hmm. um, the picture mover machine, and I was involved with planning and shooting stuff for that. Um, so when the paint box came along, um, you know, I was one of the the, the people responsible yeah. for you know looking at new effects technologies and so that was how I came across it. Mm. We, 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 at the point when we bought, so we bought the first the, the, the first one went to the BBC, mm -hmm. and the second one ever sold went to us. So wow. we got the first one that wasn't in a broadcaster. Um, but we had no idea what to do. It was a new technology. We just knew this is something that nothing else can do. Yeah. And we've made such success with the Ultimat and with the, the, the 5,000, you know, the Quantel picture mover, you know, the number of commercials that, that you know, all the titles were zooming <laughs> up and down like this for a couple of years. Um, so um, anyway, uh, so, so we went for it and we, we just thought of it as a tool that we'd use. So we had two people mm -hmm. making commercials. There was a guy called Bill Mather made the film ones and there was me made the video ones. So, you know, our natural assumption was we were the two kind of art creatives, you know, in the company. So we would do the paint box on our projects and it would be like all the other equipment, including the edit suite. They would just sit there if we weren't doing it, you know, it was for our own production. So anyway, we, we you know, that was the way we started out and, and we kind of learned, I mean, it's pretty... So you had learned, less did menus you self than this then? one. Were you self yeah, I mean, it had less menus than mm. this. It was mm. very easy to get a hang of. Yeah. So we, so we did that, and that, that was all right. But then one day, a, a commercial came along. But it was nothing to do with either Bill or I. It was one of their post-production jobs. So it, you know, it'd been shot on film, and it was for Penguin Biscuits. Um, and they had all the usual thing. There was like six creatives from the agency all sitting <laughs> at the back of the edit suite, and they're editing away. And the show has been playing out. It's played out that night. So it was going to the whole. Because in those days, you know, the, the commercials, each ITV company was separate and they all put out different commercials. Yeah. Okay. And so they had a, a magic moment on a Saturday, on a Saturday morning. Uh, oh, ITV was only ever a network on Saturday afternoon when the sports went out. That was the only time that the whole network was all connected right. up. All the rest of the time, the independent companies in, in Wales and yeah. in, in the Midlands and in yeah. the south of England, you know, were all different. Yeah. Um, and they all played, and there were separate companies, and they played out their own commercials, and they negotiated the deals with the clients and all that. So the thing was that all the commercials, you know, tended to be made in London. So the ITV network only existed from 12.30 when their sports programme started. Mm -hmm. 
But obviously they had to set the network up to get it and, and make sure it's all working because that sport program, it had to go flawlessly. Yeah. And the rest of the week, ITV wasn't a network, so it had to set it up. And it all went through the post office tower, yeah. um, you know, the, the yeah. telecom tower. Yeah. So um, what they did was they used to set it up at 11 o'clock and between 11.30 and 12.30, they played out all the commercials that would be shown in the whole of the okay. UK for that week and each TV station recorded them all Okay. But they actually didn't usually record them all. They just recorded the ones that they would play out right. and then put them onto tapes that they put in their cart machine. Uh -huh. So for that hour, they were all played out. And that was the only time it happened during the week. If, if you missed that and you had an ad going out on Monday, mm -hmm. you know, if it was on Saturday, you were really doomed. But if it was going out on Monday, then the alternative is you'd have to make a tape and put it on a motorcyclist and the motorcyclist would have to take yeah. it the whole way to the station. That was the only way. There was no other way of getting it there. Oh, there wasn't a line. The ITV network only existed for those four or wow. five hours. So anyway, and this ad for this ad had to be, this was on a Friday and the ad was being played out on Saturday morning, tomorrow. So it yeah. had to be finished. And they're all sitting in the edit suite. And they get to the end, and the editor says, now look, this is the point. I'm going to press the button. This is all going to be made. The master's copy is going to be made. Yeah. It's going to be played out. You have to tell me now. This is the moment of reckoning. Mm -hmm. And they played it again. And then one of the guys says, this voice piped up from the back, and I'm not exaggerating. This is the <laughs> honest to God truth. said, we've assumed that the biscuit, the pack, you know, was a placeholder because you're showing us the green biscuit, the green packaging, yeah. but the ads for the one in the blue packaging. Oh my God. Well, this is all on film, you know, oh. I mean, this is like, and you could you color it's not it. on a video. <laughs> so they would, well, I, but why didn't somebody say, you know, we've been oh. here for two days. And they said, well, we just thought, you know, I mean, the biscuits are all the same size. We thought you were just doing that because you hadn't R1 ready yet or something. No. no. So then they said, well, we've got this new bit of kit. I don't know. We don't know what it really does. But so I'd been shooting all day light. I was lighting in the yeah. studio and I'd been shooting. And so they called me down and they said, do you think you can? And of course, it was a static. It was the pack shot. So it was a static shot. And I said, oh, well, if you can feed me one frame, I think I probably can change it from green to blue. So we loaded it in the paint box and I changed it, you know, and then they went back and, they, and it was like you said earlier, but everybody was treating you like God. I mean, this was like <laughs> impossible. They, uh, this, the, 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 they had almost lost their 20 grand yeah. they spent on their commercial by not being able to use it. Um, and so this was a miracle. Yeah. Well, of course, they all tell their mates and all that. And from this point on, That's we were getting jobs fun. for the paint box. Now, yeah. we had thought of the paint box as being, you know, a graphic tool for making up titles and, and you mm -hmm. know, putting superimposition and things like that, making up logos and stuff. Yeah. We'd never thought of using it on live action material mm -hmm. at all, it never occurred to us. So anyway, then of course, Bill and I, who were supposed to be, you know, directing our commercials, mm -hmm. every, we finished in the studio, you know, we, if it, I always lit my thing. So I'd be in there with the electricians at 7.30 in the morning and we'd finish, you know, at seven o'clock at night or whatever. And then I'd have to go to the paint box because there was two. only Bill and I with only two people <laughs> and start doing that. And at two o'clock in the morning, I you know, dr drag myself out and I'm lighting in the studio at 7.30 with the electricians the next morning again. And Into you know, mom. it's like, so Into we mom. suddenly realized yeah. less than two, I mean, it was about a month in, we realized actually this machine sure. is, right. this is a money printing press. Yeah. for commercials yeah. because every single thing that's wrong there's a you know there's a hair there's a pack shot shot on film so you can't do anything about it and there's a there's a little bit of you know biscuits broken off in the corner there's a little black mark on the cyclorama cloth yeah. that nobody noticed till you know because they were just looking at the film yeah. um, and, and 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 all these things can be fixed and so we realized we have to get an operator and so at that stage we got in an operator so i operated the machine for literally two months and after that, I had an operator and I'd go down and say, right, we'll want that bit of black stuff or, you know, you want that green change to blue yeah. or can you paint a shadow in there and whatever. And I'd go off and come back two hours later or they'd, you know, bleep me and say, yeah. come back and have a look. Yeah. And so, so I only operated for that long. That but when cool. Harry came along, I did play with that just to get familiar with it. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, when you were talking about your origins mm -hmm. in it and the fact when you started, there weren't any, you know, there was no, I mean, we, we, we find some artists to do this. Yeah. Um, that was just somebody you know that happened to be around that we, we picked but when we got the harry which was much more complex and we had the first harry as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. um the um 
the only way we could deal with it was that we, and we had to spend a lot of money on this to encourage him to do it, and it caused a lot of bad feeling, but we basically took the demonstrator from Quantel. <laughs> so we, we hired the guy that was the, 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 man, the, man, the main man at, 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 yeah. at Quantel yeah. that went to the exhibitions and when, when people went to see if they were going to buy it, you know, did the demonstration yeah. of it. It was the only person in the entire world, not just in the country, but in the world, mm -hmm. That, that was it. familiar with it and yeah. had played with it for six months, and we just offered him, an, you know, enough money to get him to leave, yeah. you know, the company where yeah. his career was based. Uh, and he uh, currently his most recent credit is on. Um, uh, um, <laughs> a film. Blade Runner, Blade Blade Runner. the new Blade Runner. He <laughs> just was yes. visual effects supervisor. Um, yeah, and the guy that we took from Quantel yeah. uh, is currently has a credit on Blade Runner, which God. he's just finished. Oh so my God. he has continued well, um, that, to do great work. They were unique yeah. machines. And the names are, why do they call them such? Harriet, ha Henry, Ruff, I, I've I got, don't know. I, 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 somebody, I, I think somebody told me an age ago, and I might be wrong, or maybe they might have been joking, that it was something to do with the royal family, that the names are from... Oh, maybe. But, yeah. I, I have no I, I mean, that I know. Might, that might the, have been that first, Quantel person having the, a, a joke the, with me. The first one was Harry. I've no idea it was, why, why it was called Harry. I know that they then wanted, you know, to use names that began with an H. Yeah. And the, the editing one they called Henry because it was. And then the Harriet was. Harriet okay. suggests smaller. Yeah. And so, um, et. Yeah. Meaning, you know, um, so the Harriet was because it was a smaller, smaller than the Harry, but but I don't know the origin of Harry. Oh, I know the origin of Quantel, but yeah. I don't know the origin of um, of Harry. And I, I I I do vaguely remember that somebody said it was the name of somebody relevant. It yeah. was yeah, I see. Somebody a researcher that suggested it, or somebody that worked on it, or you know, it was a working title, and then it I mean certainly it was a working title in the company and then clients or prospective buyers mm. um, heard it and all liked it and responded well and they thought what if that would be a great name to call something by a person's name. Yeah, um, it made it not just a bit of kit, it was a person wasn't it almost, I don't know. Oh and then the other <laughs> thing, <laughs> talking about the, how the order of these things and yeah. how they came about was the, um, the fact was that of course there was flame came late mm. later on there was flame came and the, the difference between what is the difference between a harry or a henry and a flame and and basically the difference was that the flame was a piece of software that ran on a generic computer yeah whereas yeah. the harry and the henry and the paint box were all Just a piece of specific hardware it, yeah. and that was all it did but to run flame you would buy a silicon graphics computer yeah. of the spec that they required and then install it like you now would install you know microsoft was, word on a computer what was it? flint was like the baby that was like harriet so it's flame flint, oh, well, flame was inferno yeah. all these inferno was the big it was one all flint fire, was the small one fire based isn't yeah. it so it was quite their, their strategy for naming their kit actually was quite interesting i yeah, found that quite yeah. quite unique and the way they then could this was just one interface it, there you know there it is there was no idea that I could, and the limitations on some of this sometimes when I built like a 3D object out of different VT cutouts, I could access them together, join them together, and then globally rotate them. Sometimes I'd have that made, built, I keen framed it, and then if I wanted to <coughs> slightly rotate and I had like a global command, which the axis would be here, and I wanted just to swing it just slightly to come and animate across, sometimes it would just lose it. And it'd end up like behind you. <laughs> and behind you'd lose it. You'd lose. You, you can't find it. it. You'd spend ages doing minus two or minus. Yeah. Where's it gone? Where's it gone? Whereas and you couldn't zoom out right like now. I couldn't yeah. Apple Z it, and I couldn't on the Flint go back to the schematics and pull it back into you know. So this was, I would say, the only thing is that sometimes with keyframes and the the size of it, sometimes it would it would just flip, wouldn't it? Yeah. And it would just yeah, yeah, yeah. you you were lost, and all you could do was original all. Yeah. and start again yeah. <laughs> and there were other ones you know there was because there was like symbolics was 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 a really heavy duty artificial intelligence early artificial intelligence um I mean, it, 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 you know a computer designed for 
programming mm -hmm. in the early idea of what artificial intelligence was, yeah. not yeah. what not they not, considered yeah. now. Um, and there was symbolics machines, and they were another company that were, you know, it was military stuff, and then they needed to increase their clients so they'd go broke, and so they went after entertainment and, and medicine. But uh, then they did eventually go broke, but, they, but we, we played an MPC, we played with their machine for a while, and then we ended up, we used Alias, which was the 3D I, yeah, software yeah, that we used, yeah. um, which became Maya, Yeah. and yeah. Maya is still used. going, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. At, at one stage, uh, you know, the company I worked for, Moving Pictures, was part of the same company as Quantel at one stage. And so when they wanted advice and, and you know, brainstorming sessions with operators, we, we were always the first ones to get to chat to them um, because, you know, we were part of the same family. Um, and uh, Paul Keller was head of research. And, uh, and uh, you know, I, I had remember having a meeting with him where I, I myself and uh, Richard Bain who you know was the operator um, we uh, had lunch with him and you know and we, we were saying well you know the, and, and of course we were thinking corporate and we were saying well no but what do you want to do at this stage there were other like flame had started to appear and and now there was there was PCs uh, and and early Macintoshes that you know had a good um, graphics capabilities and, and desktop publishing was opening up. We were saying, look, you know, it's so famous that your, your stuff is used on all the big TV shows and the public knows the name. Paintbox is now, you know, like Hoover. It's one of those generic names. Um, and what you guys should do is you should write a suite, in, a software suite that reproduces the, the, exactly the menus and the methodology of swiping on and off and everything, recreate exactly what your hardware does in software that you would put on any PC or SGI workstation. Um, and then, you know, instead of selling 1,000 machines at 50,000 pound each, you'd be able to sell a million machines, uh, sorry, a million boxes of software for 200 pounds. But in fact, your million two hundred pounds would be worth more than your, your, you yeah. know, your thousand, fifty thousand pounds. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, "Well, you miss no, no, no. That's of no interest to us because basically, what that means is we'd be sitting at a desk, and some man in in China or Singapore would be running a factory, making the discs in the box and printing the boxes and and selling them. And so, you know, that's not us anymore. We're artisans. Our greatest product isn't." the paint box or the Henry. Our greatest product is this factory. Mm -hmm. Our product is the production line that for a price that is still, you know, pretty affordable for this amazing hardware. Yeah. And our hardware will do it faster than a generic piece of software on a, yeah. a you know, sorry, yeah. than a piece of software on a generic yeah. computer. Yeah. Our hardware will do it faster because yeah. it's, it's, it's optimized for just doing just that painting job. But our art, and our creation is the factory and the infrastructure that has designed and created this magic box that is only this size and can do all this stuff. And if we came to just selling, um, you know, discs with software on it, well, we'd retire. Yeah. Now, what is interesting is that eventually, you know, it, it all did go that way and Flame came along and Flame actually wiped out most of their yeah. products yeah. because Flame was exactly that, a, ge a, a, a generic computer that you install a piece of software on and they just sold the software. Um, and interesting that Paul Keller, who was the head of research and the, and the designer of a lot of these things and the, the, the principal creative behind it all, um, when he retired, and he retired because he had something to go to, what did he do? He went and headed up the project to restore and rebuild the Colossus at Bletchley Park. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting is that that is a kind of complete circumlocation of his career because he'd started out doing stuff for military, the, yeah, you know, right. the war yeah. ended, then the military wasn't buying much anymore. He went into television and then he eventually retired and went back to rebuilding the machine that he probably, <laughs> at the beginning, as, as a trainee yeah. in his teens, but he would never That's be it. able to speak about it, it probably worked yeah. on.